When Reina Marroquin moved from El Salvador to the United States in 1966, she regularly sent letters to her family, telling them about her new life abroad. But one day the letters stopped, and it would be over 30 years before Reina's family learned about her fate. Our moment in crime is the murder of Reina Marroquin. Don't be mad, I told the truth. These words were found written in an address book that had been discovered in an unusual way. The 2nd of September 1999 was the day that the Cohen family were moving out of their house in Jericho, Long Island. Ronald Cohen noticed that a large drum that had been left for sanitation workers to collect had not been picked up. The drum was 55 gallons and was too heavy for the sanitation workers to move. The drum had been found in the crawl space of the Cohen's home years earlier. The Cohen's and previous owners of the house left the drum in the crawl space because of its weight. One owner decided not to open the drum as a label warned that the drum contained chemicals. Ronald had been asked by the new owner to remove the drum. Now that the drum had finally been removed from the crawl space, Ronald's curiosity led to him prizing open the drum as his real estate agent looked on. Upon looking into the drum, Ronald realised why it had been so heavy. Inside was the mummified body of a woman. The body had been sitting in the barrel in a cross-legged position. The woman was between the ages of 20 and 30, was roughly 5 feet tall, was either white or Hispanic, had long brown hair and gold in her front teeth. The dental work looked to have been carried out in South America. She was wearing socks, a skirt and a button-down sweater. Her cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. Ten lacerations were found on the back and upper parts of her head and her skull had multiple fractures. Blood stains showed that the woman sustained these injuries while she was alive. Perhaps most shockingly of all, an x-ray revealed that the woman was pregnant. The baby was a boy and the woman was at full term. Also found in the drum were two rings and a locket that had To Patrice, Love Uncle Phil inscribed on it. A fake leopard skin coat and a makeup bag were found, along with plastic pellets and a green plastic flower stem with leaves. The pellets in the flower stem would provide investigators with clues, as would a purse found submerged in a brown and green liquid at the bottom of the drum. The purse contained papers and an address book. As they had been severely damaged by the liquid, these items were left in a forensic drying cabinet for days to remove the moisture. While waiting for the contents of the purse to dry out, detectives began tracing the origins of the drum. Serial numbers led them to a chemical company located in Linden, New Jersey. The company's records show that the drum was manufactured in 1965. The company also provided detectives with information regarding the liquid and the pellets. The liquid was a heliogen green dye used to colour the bases on plastic trees and flowers. The dye hadn't been made since 1971. The pellets were used to make plastic flowers and leaves. This information tied in with details given to police in an anonymous telephone call. The caller had mentioned where the drum came from and how chemicals were used to mix the bases for the plastic flowers. Although the caller didn't know the deceased woman's name, he said the woman was Hispanic and that she was having an affair during the 1960s with the owner of the factory she worked in. The owner's surname was Elkins and this wouldn't be the only time investigators came across his name. 
When the process of drying the papers and address book had finished, forensic scientists used a video spectro comparator to read any writing. The video spectro comparator uses a range of infrared light sources to make writing that can't be seen with the naked eye visible. The liquid in the drum had removed the ink on the papers, while the address book revealed a resident alien number, names and addresses. Investigators attempted to contact those named, but found that most of them had moved on. However, detectives were able to track down Cathy Andrade, who was still living in the same address and used the same phone number as those listed in the address book. When detectives visited her, Cathy knew what they wanted to discuss. When told about the body in the drum and her name being listed in the address book, Cathy instantly knew that the body was that of a friend who had vanished in the 1960s. Using an immigration photo, Cathy identified the woman in the drum as 27-year-old Raina Angelica Marroquin. After finding out that her husband had a mistress who was pregnant with his child, Raina Marroquin moved from El Salvador to the USA. The year was 1966, and after arriving in Miami, she moved to New York City, where she began working as a nanny before quitting without explanation after two months. Raina then moved into the Joan of Arc home, a Catholic home for single women in Manhattan, on the 6th of June 1967. Raina attended the High School of Fashion Industry and worked at the Melrose Plastic Company. She dreamed of becoming an American citizen and began taking English classes taught by Cathy Andrade. Raina regularly wrote to her family back in El Salvador, but the letters stopped in the spring of 1969. Raina had vanished. In the run-up to her disappearance, Raina told Cathy that she was pregnant. She didn't name the father, but mentioned that he was married with three children. Despite this, Raina believed him when he said he planned to marry her and move with her to New Jersey. When reality began to sink in, Raina called her lover's wife and told her about the affair and the pregnancy. But after receiving a threatening phone call from her lover, who said he was going to kill her, Raina called Cathy, saying she'd made a stupid mistake. Worried about her friend, Cathy made her way over to Raina's room at the Joan of Arc home. The door to her room was unlocked, and Raina was nowhere to be found. Warm food sat on the stove. Cathy waited for three hours before going to the police. As Cathy didn't know the identity of the man Raina had been having an affair with, the police told her there was little they could do. Cathy was also told she would have to wait to report her friend missing, as Raina had only been gone for a day. Although Cathy couldn't provide any details about the man Raina was seeing, investigators began to think that they had a chance of tracing the man when they noticed the name Mr Elkins in Raina's address book, the same name that the anonymous caller had given the police when he mentioned the affair. Detectives decided to look into who lived in the home the drum had been found in during the 1960s. The owner was a man named Howard Elkins. Detectives spoke to residents in the Jericho neighbourhood Elkins had once lived in. The detectives were told that Elkins had moved away from Jericho after selling his part of a company he owned. That company was located in Manhattan and made plastic plants, trees and flowers. The company used the exact type of dye, pellets and drums found in the Jericho home. The company was called the Melrose Plastic Company and was the same company Rayner had been employed at. 
Police discovered that Elkins, who was now in his 70s, was living in the Crystal Lake skated community near Boca Raton, Florida. By now, the police were confident that Elkins was the father of Rayner's baby and the killer. Detectives travelled to Florida to question Elkins. Investigators believe that after Rayner contacted his wife to tell her of the affair in the baby, Elkins lured Rayner to his factory. He beat her to death in the factory and then took her body to his Jericho home. Elkins put Rayner's body in the drum and weighted it down with plastic pellets to make sure it would sink, as he planned to dump Rayner into the ocean from his boat. At £350, however, the drum was too heavy to carry to his boat. Elkins then hid the drum in the crawl space of his house. When detectives confronted Elkins with their theory, he denied that the company he owned used the dye, drums and pellets that were found in his old home. Elkins admitted he'd had an affair, but said he didn't know the woman's name and that he was unable to describe her. When asked to provide a DNA sample to compare with the babies, Elkins refused to cooperate. A phone call from Elkins' wife interrupted the interview and Elkins asked the detectives to leave. He wanted to speak to his wife privately. As the detectives left, they told Elkins they would get a court order for the DNA sample and that they were confident that it would match the baby. They would then return, the detectives said, to arrest him. Ruth Elkins learned about Rayner's body being found in her former home after a friend in New York sent her a newspaper clipping. As it had been hours since she last saw her husband, Ruth reported him missing. On the 10th of September 1999, Elkins was found dead in his neighbour's garage by police and his son. After the detectives left, Elkins headed out and bought a shotgun and two boxes of shells at Walmart. He paid $247 in cash. Knowing his neighbour's house was empty, he climbed into the back seat of his neighbour's car and shot himself in the head. A sample of Elkins' blood was taken to test for paternity. The baby's DNA had to be amplified to allow for testing, as the tissue samples were badly degraded. The results left detectives with, quote, no doubt, end quote, that Elkins had killed Rayner. There was a 99.93% chance that Elkins was the father. Police felt that the message in Rayner's address book that read, quote, don't be mad, I told the truth, end quote, was a note from Rayner to Elkins. Rayner's family learned of her fate after journalist Oscar Coral covered the story for Newsday. He was able to track down Rayner's 95-year-old mother in San Martin, a village in El Salvador. After learning what had happened to her daughter, Rayner's mother said she dreamed that her daughter was in a barrel. Although the authorities were confident that Elkins was Rayner's murderer, they were left feeling that Elkins may have taken one secret in particular to the grave. One day, Rayner had arrived at work with a toddler. She laughed and joked that Elkins was the toddler's father, but some colleagues wondered if there was a seed of truth in the jokes. In the end, the authorities determined that Rayner was looking after someone else's child that day. The police also believed that the Patrice and Uncle Phil referred to on Rayner's necklace and initials found on her rings are unrelated to her. Rayner wore the jewellery because she liked the pieces. Cathy Andrade remembers her friend as a lovely person. And Rayner's family remember her as someone who had hopes and dreams. As she made plans to move to the United States, Rayner told her family, I'm going to be somebody. 
I'm going to be somebody someday.